Best Con podcasting channel. I'm James S. Aaron, and I'll be moderating and maybe jumping in every now and then, um, depending on how loquacious everyone is. Um, we're really lucky today to have some of the most experienced science fiction and fantasy podcasters in the business with us to talk about what they do and why they love it. Um, I want to run through some quick introductions, and then we will get into uh, get into some questions. So, first up, Tom Merritt has been Tom. You want to wave? I guess we got your name, so we can see that. Yeah, <laughs> Tom Merritt has been co-host of the Sword and Laser podcast with Veronica Belmont since 2007 for nearly 400 episodes. Sword and Laser publishes weekly book reviews, industry news, and author interviews with too many big names in the industry to list here. They also have a thriving community of readers and listeners. Lauren Moore is uh, a co-host of The Writer's Journey, where she shares great interviews on writing craft, the publishing industry, and interviews with writers like R.A. Salvatore and Michael Sullivan. Mark Leslie Lefebvre has been working in the publishing industry for more than 20 years and might be the best resource out there on hybrid publishing. Mark's podcast, Stark Reflections, offers author and industry interviews, news, and stories from Mark's personal writing journey, often with a Canadian flavor and craft beer flavor, I should add that. Um, Josh Hayes is a founding member of Keystroke Medium. Um, it's a Facebook group, live show, and podcast focused on resources for genre writing, news, and interviews with folks like David Weber and Peter F. Hamilton. Keystroke Medium is like your virtual bar where readers and writers can hang out and talk about their favorite stories. It's a fun place to be. So each of our guests is, is, true. <laughs> is true. Each of our guests is also an SF author, and you should definitely check out their work. Links and more information about them is available on the SFFCon website at sffcon.com. So we're also taking questions in the live chat. Uh, so if there's some place the conversation doesn't go that you would like to ask about, please share that. Um, and we'll do our best to get to it. We've only got an hour, so um, you can also join the SFFCon Discord and follow up there, and we'll do our best to uh, to get on those questions. So, okay, um, I'm hoping this will be kind of a freeform conversation. Just um, talk about why we love podcasting and what it is that makes it such a, a great form of media. So, um, I don't know who wants to jump in first. Mark, why why yeah. podcast? Well, I think one of the things that I love most about podcast is that intimate experience that you have. I mean, we were born uh, in, in in our mother's wombs. The you know we heard our mother's voice. It was the very very first thing we heard. Her heartbeat, her voice. Sound is a very intimate emotional experience for us. And so with podcasting, I think when we communicate with our audiences. We're with them on their journey, no, no matter what they're doing. They could be washing the dishes, walking the dog, going for a run, however they're listening to us. Uh, we, we get to have that most intimate experience. And, and I love that as a listener. And that's something that I know that my listeners uh, enjoy from my podcast. Yeah, anyone else want to add to that? Um, really, I started, I started talking... Uh, I started the podcast just because I, I wanted to talk about something and I wanted to, to hear what other people had to say about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Scott and I started Keystroke with one show uh, just because uh, we wanted to talk about a specific subject um, and get responses and feedback from other people that um, maybe not necessarily didn't want to speak online, but they could, you know, speak in the comments and, and speak in email and, and Facebook and all that stuff and, and providing a platform for people to share. Um, but really it was more selfish than anything because I was just starting in my, my writer, uh, life and I wanted to glean all of the stuff that I could get from everybody. So the, the authors that we had on, uh, the first, the first few seasons and even now in season five, um, just getting a whole bunch of, tips and tricks from them as a selfish person to to be a better writer and then it just naturally became a a platform for other people to get that information that they're looking for too and josh it worked i was in India yeah. at the time as a uh, christian school teacher and i wanted to get into editing but how do you do that where can you find the information on what it takes to be an editor and then eventually you know my goal is to be an author after that so podcasting was how I got a lot of my information. The book editor show, um, self-publishing uh, guys, those, those guys are awesome. Your show, and your show was every Thursday night. It was a community that was talking about topics, that was talking about information and encouraging each other. And that is 100% how I got my start into editing and then became an author. And then later you dragged me into podcasting too. So here I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I think it is that conversation uh, that mm-hmm. that is so attractive. Uh, like you were saying, Mark, we 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 are attracted to to voice and and to talking, and there's there's something very intimate about podcasting. Uh, for me, I I started in radio in 1986. And when podcasting came along in 2004, I was immediately on it. I wanted to, to get into it and start doing it because I just really enjoy having conversations with smart people. And like you said, Josh, like bringing people in, uh, having people like Lauren, you know, in the audience that then get inspired and start doing podcasts themselves. It's really fun uh, to be a part of all that. And, and it's that conversation that really is what I enjoy the most. So it sounds like, you know, I, I think when I first envisioned podcasting, it was that sort of one way media that uh, I kind of expected folks to say, well, it was an opportunity to create audio media that you wouldn't have necessarily if you couldn't get that in with a radio station. But it's sounding like the social aspect of it was what drew um, a lot of you to it. That's really that's interesting. Um, has that been what has inspired you about it as as your shows and things have progressed and reaching people and having those people speak back to you? Yeah, I think that independence was was a big attraction at the beginning, but it's the mm-hmm. it's the conversation and the the social aspect uh, that that keeps it going. You know, that keeps it interesting and keeps it evolving and, and fun to do. One hundred percent. I think, uh, like I said, when, when Scott and I first started, it was it was kind of on accident, and uh, we had, we we'd done uh, these weekly writer meetings. And I told my wife, "Hey, I'm going to have my writer meeting," and she's like, "You're going to go have coffee with Scott and talk about books." And and yes, that's exactly what it was. And then. <laughs> Um, it by accident, we couldn't do it in person one day, so we did it online, and then it kind of uh, progressed into to, to doing a show, and um, and now it's become other things. But it's it's uh, it's that the, the 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 having something to say, and then having people that want to listen to you. But but it's not it's not just about having something to say for me. Uh, it's it's now it's grown into the community, and and it's it's one of those fun things where every every week I can sit down and hang out with. You know, thirty or forty of my closest friends, and and it's it's uh, it's providing. Um, it, it's not like when you watch like the news or you, you listen to the radio. Um, you listen to the radio, and you, you like, for instance, you listen to uh, I don't know uh, Bobby Bones or somebody that's popular online. And a lot of times, you don't really get to have that personal connection with that person um, just because they're doing the radio show. They've, they've got to pay attention to that. We do a live show, and we try to pay attention to our, our live viewers and, and 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 incorporate them into the show, whether it's asking a question or they make a silly statement, and we we bring that into the show, and it becomes uh, more of of my broadcast but everybody's uh thing it's interesting josh when you talk about the fact that you were just going to go and have coffee and talk about writing because that's kind of what podcasting feels is i'm gonna have these passionate intimate conversations with people because i need to learn all the awesome stuff that they can teach me (laughs) i'm just recording it and so it's the conversations you would be having anyways because you're enthusiastic and passionate about it you happen to record it, and now you can involve, as you said, other people in those discussions. So if you're doing it live, you can incorporate the questions and comments that they have live into it. Or if it's not uh, recorded live, if it's done that, uh, that way you've got the comments and people sharing and commenting. Just um, just this morning, for example, on, on my most recent podcast episode, I, I stumbled and I couldn't come up with the word that meant streak. Like, you know, continually doing something day after day because was talking about NaNoWriMo. And I, and I just, and I struggled through about six different words, got the wrong one and said, oh, you guys will, you guys will get it for me. And of course I'm getting all kinds of comments and, and stuff that people are offering. I think you mean this, I think. So it's that sense of we're in this together that really brings it home. Yep. Well, let me ask this. Do you think of yourselves as outgoing? Like, is it, are you, are you an outgoing person? Are you an extrovert? Or do you think of yourself as an introvert? Oh, total introvert. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, Mark was talking, I was thinking, oh, I'm like a nobody freelance editor from Delaware. I would not have the opportunity to have these conversations. But because of the community and because of the interest in the conversations and the the topics and the authors, I'm able to reach out to Christopher Paolini and he says yes to come on our show. Hmm. So I get to have advice from, from these authors who've been in the trenches, who've been writing for you know years, who've gone through the different difficulties that I might be just facing now as a new author, and to get their wisdom now, so I can implement those changes now and uh, bring in the the audience as a part of it. It's exciting. I love it. But in real life, uh, no, I'm pretty introverted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely an extrovert. Definitely. 
100 percent. i'm probably the loudest one in the room wherever you go <laughs> well, maybe that's the cool thing about podcasting because i feel like i'm pretty introverted as well like when lockdown mm -hmm. happened it didn't really change my daily habit because i don't leave the house much anyway so that was a dream <laughs> right uh, and uh, and and yet I I, I co-host with a with a few extroverts, so mm -hmm. it it's it's kind of attracts all spectrum. I think. I think the podcasting allows you to be an omnivert, right? So I consider mm -hmm. myself an introvert as well. But when required, when I'm on stage, I'm good. Just don't send me into a room, ask me to introduce myself to a bunch of people, because that's when I'll <laughs> that's when I'll get all bashful and hide in the corner. Well, right, right. It's too, depending on how you do it, like uh, like if you're just. Uh, Tom, I'm not really sure how, how your platform works, but if you're just doing a pre-recorded show and then putting it out, um, that's, that's a different platform than doing a live show and, and, uh, and interacting. Um, and I think like, I've got a lot of feedback from, from guests or people that won't come on the show because we are live and they don't want to, they don't want to be put out there and, and, uh, and seen in that, but though they would very much do a, an audio only recorded show. And it, so it's interesting to see uh how having a live show really changes kind of how people perceive your show in particular definitely definitely i do i do a live daily show and have for years but sword and laser has gone from pre-recorded to live and back to pre-recorded mm. uh because there's there's less pressure when when you don't have to do it live right you also don't have that extra brain like you were talking about mark where mm -hmm. people can think of a word for you so there's trade-offs there. yeah so how you know that that's something I was just thinking about. So say I'm, I'm interested in podcasting. It's something I, I would like to do. How did you make that, that progression from, and maybe, you know, Tom, things you've learned over time or, you know, just recently between the choice between pre-recorded and live, how do you make that step into not necessarily being professional, but, um, just getting started. And then what would you recommend to folks that might be interested in, in podcasting? Yeah. Uh, my, my advice over the years has always been just start. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's only gotten easier uh, I used to recommend this, what I thought at the time was simple uh, steps of just, you know, take the mic you have. Don't worry about getting a mic. You can do that later. Just start recording stuff. Put it up on archive.org. Create a WordPress blog, blah, 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 blah. Now you just get Anchor or something like mm -hmm. that. And you, it's it's even easier. You can just do it on your phone. But my, my biggest uh, thing to people is don't let the process get in the way of starting. All you need is a thing you are passionate about talking about. And you can mm -hmm. start and just learn as you go just get the get the practice in uh rather than feeling like everything has to be perfect before you launch so what would folks say they have learned over time like once they they did make that start because i i think most, po most podcasts last five episodes and then uh you know it kind of drops off um yeah how what <laughs> could folks share like what you've learned and how that has helped you keep keep going um yeah i think you know going back to the, the getting started and kind of how it rolls into the the learning uh, uh as you go um I, really what what you, you do what is more comfortable for you um and i say that because some people don't like the live aspect right or some people um aren't, aren't sure what to do like if you have a live show and then you have that that negative space where you're like well what do i say next and then you're just looking at the camera and then you're getting nervous because you don't know what to say and you're, your palms start sweating and you're like okay i'm done and you hit you hit off or if you're just recording you can have that space and then go out and edit it edit it out later but it's super easy to do um the reason we did live is because that was the easiest way for us to just record everything and then be done um because it, when you do mm -hmm. recording there is a lot of extra stuff you, if you're going to go in and take all the ums out for for instance or if you're going to take all the, the the lag space or the dead space between conversations and and do like you know, pre-roll audio or you're capping, you know, at the beginning, at the end, there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do. Um, or do you just want to talk? Um, we got into doing it live because it was the easiest way for us to do it. Um, but it was really tough. And, uh, you know, getting started, you're going to do 50 episodes and no one's going to listen to them. Uh, and so you really have to be uh, cognizant of, of why you're doing it and um, know that, you're, it's not gonna. You're gonna release a show, and you're gonna have a hundred thousand downloads on your first episode. It's just you know that's it, having your expectations set to where reasonable levels are. Um, I think that we've learned so much in the five seasons that we've been doing this, and, and we call seasons, but they're just five years. Uh, we've been doing. We started out with with live, and now we have three different weekly shows. Um, we have the writer's journey, we have live, and then we have coffee and concepts. And each of those shows are different in the their. 
uh, presentation and the material that they cover. Um, but just like just getting started and doing it, I would suggest recording 15 episodes before you put anything out. Um, especially when you're starting and you want to record your first episode, record it a couple of times and just see how it sounds and see what you like to do and then just put it out there. Uh, but we've learned a lot of just uh, becoming more comfortable in, in front of the microphone. Um, that takes a lot of time to, to get comfortable and, and just know that when you're talking, you can slow down or you can speed up and just, yeah, that, that's my answer. <laughs> And rambling is okay too. That's what I do all the time. <laughs> Mark, how's that? How's oh, that work sorry, for you? James. I was just going to ask how that worked for you. How that went for you? I, I, <laughs> oh, I was inviting you to speak on the uh, on the sorry, subject. I thought you were following up with Josh. No. I, I, I just. Uh, I was going to comment that um, people are a lot more forgiving. Uh, when, uh, Josh was talking about uh, live. And I think that is one of the benefits. You don't have to go into post-production. You don't have to, I do edit a lot of ums out. Uh, I mean, I learned that post-production editing was going to take a significant chunk out of every single week. Mm -hmm. um, there you go. I would have just cut that um right there. Uh, not the second one, I was quoting an um. So that's the, and, and that's the reality, but you want to leave enough in there to be authentic. But people are so forgiving of that. And also when you're talking to your niche audience, when you're talking to them, they're just as passionate uh, ideally about the topic as you. So they're going to be a little bit more forgiving. But I think one of the things that I learned was like writing. So it's a parallel to writing. You publish a book and you put it out there and you sell a whack of them and you get a really, really small percentage of people who take the time to leave a review. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with podcasts. And so I'm constantly startled because I don't get a lot of comments. I do actually have an you know, engaging community. I love the people who are commenting and interacting and stuff, but it's a very, very small percentage. So it always shocks me when I go somewhere and people say, oh, I, 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 and they comment on something I said in, in last week's podcast. And that actually shocks me because I don't get a lot of those comments um, you know, on the blog itself or on Twitter or anything like that. But then people, when they see me, not lately, not in the last nine months, but see me, in person, <laughs> oh yeah, I was just listening to your podcast last week. I'm like, oh cool. I had no idea you were listening because you don't know, right? You're surprised. Like you don't know that somebody's read your book. You don't know that they're a reader. So it's kind of an interesting, that was almost shocking to me. Well, for, you know, for me, podcasting is part of my weekly, uh, just routine. Like I pull up the podcaster, I, I have a, a list of, you know, podcasts I want to listen to. And it like, that's, that is one of the things I love about the, even like say stark reflections, that diary format is just hearing like your story. Same thing with keystroke medium sword and laser. I love the updates. Just what, what are folks up to? And that kind of intimacy, it becomes part of your weekly, um, just knowing, and, and that's one thing with COVID also, I like to know people are out there being okay, you know, and podcasting is a way, um, yeah, yeah. to, to kind of get that. But, um, one thing I was just thinking about as you were speaking was experimentation and, uh, stark reflections in general. Like you've really, one of the things I enjoy with that journey is that you've tried a lot of different things and really kind of put yourself out there. Like for instance, you know, some music and, and some things like that. So, um, what are some ways that you've experimented that have either worked or not worked? and um, yeah. that maybe we're kind of pushing your boundaries a little bit with the format. Uh, I'll, I'll start on this one, I guess. But so, yeah, <laughs> experimentation. So I, I could not write at the beginning of COVID. I was completely blocked. I had a book project on, you know, on plan, and I couldn't write. So I started writing parody lyrics because that was always a writing warm-up exercise. And then I started recording, and I'm not a singer. Um, I am not. I am a singer. I'm a horrible singer, uh, and I can mask some of it. But uh, my, my partner and I recorded parody videos and put them on YouTube. And so I, I, I played some clips and that was, I was thinking it was gonna push listeners away, but I think they appreciated the humor. The other thing I, I did early in the podcast, Find Away Voices uh, sponsors my podcast and they had asked me to do a tongue twist. And so I had a segment, I, I recorded a little clip um, uh, twisting by the pool, like tongue twisting and, and again, parody lyrics. And, uh, and, and I actually had comments from, from a small handful of people like, yeah, I understand why you do it. Because it's kind of funny. He, uh, they, uh, Will would send me a tongue twister. I would have to read it on air. I would usually open it up, read it live, and have to say it five times fast. And I would always mess up and swear and stuff, so I'd have to bleep it. Um, but I had enough people who said, yeah, I skipped that part. And so, again, there are people who liked it, but they never commented. They never let me know. But the people who didn't like it let me know. So I think it's okay to take a chance. Uh, make a fool of yourself. 
but then I didn't go back to that format because the only people who had commented had said they didn't like it. So it was like 100% of the people who commented on the tongue twister said they don't like it. So I think it's okay to change. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure that the other podcasters have tried things, tried segments, and then went, yeah, it's not resonating. Is that is that the case for some of you guys? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, I, I can't count the number of segments I've tried and killed over the years. <laughs> we've tried to do, um, we've tried to do a, uh, a lot of small bits, like uh, like we tried to do a one star review thing. Where when when we were when Patreon first started, we looked at at that as kind of a a subscriber model, and how can we maximize that? And and one of the things we thought of was doing a a one star review, where where the authors would find their w- favorite one star review. And then we would record them uh, reading it, and then we would add that to a, a, a list of, or a, 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 a monthly thing that we put out on Patreon. That if you're subscribed to our Patreon channel, you could see your author reading that favorite. Uh, and it was a really fun thing. Uh, but the one thing that we looked at was uh, what kind of value are we getting for the dollar on, on Patreon? Or is that something that is, is giving somebody value or is that just us trying to get your dollar? And so a lot of that stuff kind of, it was a good idea, but maximizing what we wanted to do with the show, um, it, it just didn't didn't set right with what we were doing. So we still do it occasionally. We just don't have that that Patreon aspect to to that. Yeah, Keeling and I, we've tried to do different series where we pick up a topic that we're really interested in and excited about, and I line up guests that can look at different aspects of that topic. Uh, That went great, but recently we've been just asking the audience, what do you want to hear? Who do you want to see? And that's the series we've been doing for the past couple months, just totally audience choice. And our views have gone up. And we've started doing the AMAs with the bigger authors and bringing more people uh, into the community. So, so that looks like an experiment that's working. Just really communicating with the audience, figuring out what they want, and then giving it to them. Because mm-hmm. that's what the platform's for, is giving them the audience that information. Mm-hmm. I, my platform is just to hear me talk. I don't know what you're, what you're doing this <laughs> week. Um, hey, if that's what the audience wants, man. That's I know, I know. Um, so, you know, we're all writers. And one thing that I think as you have different demands on your time, like how, how does podcasting fit into your other, to your writing and other things that you do, you know, cause we also make money. Right. So, um, how is podcasting fit into that? Like, could you, would you podcast full time and just do that if you could, or, um, how, how has that maybe changed over time? That's something I was curious to hear about. Uh, wants would, to jump in. I would 100% podcast if uh, 100% of the time. If that's what I got paid to do, I, I would do that. Um, and that's the other thing that maybe we could mention too is if, if you're looking to make money doing something, podcasting is probably not it. <laughs> 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 um, I will say though that uh, on that aspect, podcasting for 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 us in particular, Keystroke has opened up a lot of opportunities to make money doing other things. Um, like like writing podcast opened up a lot of network opportunities for me to meet other authors and work with them and make money that way that I would never have done without the podcast. Um, uh, but yeah, if I could podcast hundred percent of the time, I would definitely do that. 100%. And I, I forgot the last part of your question. <laughs> just, just how that had tied into other parts of your, you know, your business as an author. Oh, uh, so it does take a lot of time. So if mm-hmm. you're looking at doing it, like we mentioned, if you're doing like recorded stuff, that post production stuff that you don't think about, like the editing, but also the uploading. If you're, if you're, if you're not doing it live or you're not doing like a video format, like our format is we broadcast through Streamyard, which is what we're using now, and it goes to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. Our videos automatically stay on YouTube. They're automatically archived, and then we download the audio later and do that upload of the audio. But all of that takes a lot of time. Now, fortunately for us, we have a whole bunch of people that do one thing. So, like, uh, Kayleen takes our audio and uploads the audio. We have another guy that does our show notes. Um, we have another guy that does our website. Like, So it's easy for me now in Season 5. All I have to do is hit record, save my piece, and then hit stop broadcast. And I'm basically done, other than lining up guests and doing all that stuff. Um, but it does take a lot of time. So if you're, if you're doing a full-time author thing or you're looking at writing and doing podcasting, just know that it's going to encroach into your writing time because it, oh, that back end stuff does take a lot. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I learned that I'm a, I'm a storyteller and I've always been a storyteller. 
whether it was with the little Fisher Price figurines I played with when I was a kid and I was telling myself stories and then it became <laughs> stick figure cartoons and then it became writing. But I realized that podcasting is one element of storytelling. I'm a nonfiction storyteller when I'm talking about the business of writing and publishing or even my own author journey on the personal update segment. And so I need to be a storyteller and I need the different outlets. And I've realized that video, audio, text, are some of those outlets for me. And, and, and it kind of helps me keep me balanced as a creative storyteller. And, and I don't think, I, I don't think I would ever give up one. Uh, even if, even if nobody was listening to my podcast, I've gotten into such a habit of, of the routine of learning from people, which I'm never going to stop doing anyways. And then reflecting on the things that I'm learning, which I'm never going to do anyways. I just happen to record it. And that's just a part of it. So ideally, um, Ideally, I would want to keep all of it up um, mm -hmm. because because it, it, it nurtures me uh, in di different aspects of myself. Tom, yeah. how about for you? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. Uh, reaching out to guests, finding them in the first mm -hmm. place. Uh, Twitter is a great place for that. And then emailing with them or their assistant, uh, coming up with questions. All of this takes time throughout the week. And uh, it's easy to prioritize that over writing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so if, you, yeah. if you're a writer too, you, you really have to ask yourself, how much do I want to commit? Um, how much am I able to commit? I've got family commitments and responsibilities too, and stick with those because podcasting can easily kind of just take over your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, I'm kind of the, the, the flip of the rest of you because I do podcast full time. That That's my main <laughs> job. Lucky. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, they they say be careful what you wish for. Sometimes it, it becomes a job, but I still love it. I still enjoy it, and and I write when I can. I I have mm -hmm. a daily task to do something involving writing, uh, and and I sometimes look at it and gosh, and wish I could write full time. Uh, and but I wouldn't want to quit podcasting, so I don't know how that would work. I just need more hours in the day, I guess. But <laughs> but it took a lot to get there. Like I started podcasting in two thousand five. I was working full time. You know, thankfully, I've got a wife who who has a great job, and so that that helped me kind of be brave enough to to take the jump. Uh, but you know, I was lucky enough to have built up uh, an audience while working for other people uh, who were nice enough to follow me when I went independent. It's it's you know, to your point, Josh, it's not something where I'm like you know raking in the millions of dollars uh, right. or, or even thousands of dollars, <laughs> uh, tens but, of dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but you you know it it takes a lot of work. Uh, I do five shows a week. Uh, I mean five different shows. I do I do a daily show every day, and then I do four other weekly shows a week. Uh, that's how you make it. That's how I was able to make it uh, a a full time gig. It just it just takes a lot of work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like it's kind of mixing in a lot of different things, like the networking aspect of it. These skills are transferable to a lot of different places. Um, you're still storytelling, like Mark, Mark Mark mentioned. So, you know, one of the things I was thinking is just our media keeps changing. And so having these skills could help you transition into some new new thing. If it's not YouTube, then it's some other, you know, platform that um, do you do you find that because we, we're in a time like this, um, you know, one of the things that that statistic is so interesting to me that five, you know, most people make it five episodes and stop. What, what do you think it is that tends to make it difficult to move ahead with a podcast or what causes people to stop or, or kind of make it become not fun anymore? Has anybody experienced that? I think yeah, cause it's it, work. Yeah, it is. It, it, you know, it's, it's not jumping in and, and, being like you, you jump in in your day one, you're Rush Limbaugh, right? Like yeah. day, one, you're, day one, you're you're talking and and no one's listening. But Tom, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. That's fine. Uh, I I you know I I just think those first five episodes you do it because you want to be like that person that you admire, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then by five episodes, you realize, oh wait, I have to do all that production. I have to do all mm -hmm. of that editing. I have to do all that uploading. Uh, maybe I don't like doing that anymore. I think that's part of it. It can also be that that you realize that maybe you weren't as excited about talking about the topic. Maybe you only had one or two things to say and then you're done. Uh, I think that happens to people too. I agree. And and then you also, you got to look at the, uh, a lot of things people don't think about is, is 
the cost too. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot, but it does cost a little bit. I mean, you've got to you've got to get the URL for your web page for mm-hmm. that. You've got to pay for your audio hosting, where, uh, depending on where you do it. Um, if you're if you're not doing YouTube, but you're doing video, you've got to think about that too. And um, you know, then you've got to think of uh, other other kind like microphones. Uh, microphones. <laughs> is, is you can big, spend money on microphones. Yeah, I yeah. mean. They're, I, the, the microphone I want is like a $400 mic and I haven't bit the bullet yet because this is a good mic, but that's another thing that, you know, uh, podcasting for the most part is you is, is the audience listening to you. So if you've got a crappy mic and people don't like the sound of your show, they're not going to listen. And, and that's something that people sometimes don't consider is, uh, uh is how they sound. There was an author. Oh, sorry, James. I was just say quickly. There was an author that I, I liked listening to his author diary, but he, his chair squeaked, and it almost became like a tick of the show to hear <sighs> his chair squeaking as he would. <laughs> yeah. It was there's a nat- there's natural character. sound, and there's natural sound. Not all of it's good, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was doing the the Kobo Writing Life podcast in the early days, um, before one of the downsizings that happened at Kobo back in the in the early boom of the digital. Um, all I had to do was show up into a studio. It was a padded uh, studio with all of the high end mic equipment. I would just I would invite an author into Kobo on Kobo's dime. I would take them out for drinks and a nice meal. We'd come back. I'd take them to the studio. Everything would be laid out for us, like, you know, the Kobo mugs with water in them. We walked into the studio. We just had a conversation. Someone recorded it, walked away, you know, sent them on their way. Then they sent me all of the post-production stuff. And all I had to do was record my, but eventually on my own podcast became a reflection of what I learned. And when that changed at Kobo for me, there was a significant uh, reality hit me where I then learned oh my God, I have to do all this now. And that was a deciding factor where I said, yes, it's worth it. Because it wasn't like, um, you know, the, we were way into, uh, you know, more than five episodes by then. But it was it was a point where you had to go, oh, can I afford the time to do this? Yeah. Because it was an additional piece of work on top of the, 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 the regular job, uh, which is the same thing you have if you're doing it personally. Right. It's it's you make the time uh, for it. But that was an interesting uh, moment for me because I was I was spoiled. And now I've had people say, well, why don't you hire someone to do the post audio? I was like, well, no, because I need to listen to it again, because when I'm talking to the person, I'm engaged in the conversation, but I'm not reflecting. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so it's in the post production edit that I get a huge benefit uh, of actually doing the show notes writing, typing out the show notes while I'm listening to it and cutting out some of the us. Um, and that for me is part of the learning process. So I don't think I, well, I mean, I'm sure I could go back to being spoon fed, but it was, uh, it's an, it, it, that was an interesting turning point for me in terms of that other podcast. It's interesting. You mentioned uh, engaging and not reflecting how many shows that I went back to later and listened to and thought, I don't, a, I don't remember saying that. And then B, I don't remember the guest saying that either and learned a whole bunch from a show that I was personally involved in and, and learned from. I was recently <laughs> reminded uh, by a listener of Sword and Laser that five years ago I said uh, if I had to eat one author, it would be Patrick Rothfuss. And I, I had no memory of saying that. And I apologize to Patrick Rothfuss uh, profusely. Wow. Um, yeah. What's cool about podcasting uh, and this is probably maybe the one of the only cool things of COVID is that um, as, as soon as all of the in-person stuff stuff stopped happening, I immediately thought this is a big boon to all of us that do podcasting in this space because we're used to reaching out and going, hey, do you have headphones and a microphone? Do you want to come talk with me? Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of people weren't doing in-person interviews. And I was like, well, none of our interviews are in person and we've already got a platform set up for this. And it was it was one of those things where um, it, it, looking at the, the, the good in things, um, we can kind of capitalize on on this non in person realm. And and then it was funny because I looked at like Fox News or CNN that were doing all of these in home interviews with people. And going, man, their quality is horrible. But they've got millions <laughs> of dollars of what they're doing. Like, just they, just put the p- camera on a book or something. Come yes, on, yeah, exactly. <laughs> put a pillow around. Like, get a blanket. Do something. Like, some yeah. family member walks in the room. It's like, oh, back yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we ha we have one question I want to touch on because this is kind of uh, interesting. I haven't seen this one before. Um, so Tom, this was for you. It said, you know, with your background in radio, mm. are there any FCC rules that apply to podcasting? Uh, no. Short answer is the FCC doesn't have any jurisdiction over podcasting. Uh, the only rules about podcasting would be rules that are in in general about you know I I think it's actually libel because you publish it on the web rather than slander which is usually spoken which is a little counterintuitive but but yeah I mean any anything that you can say in public you can say on a podcast uh, mm -hmm. that said we have we follow a lot of the kinds of restrictions that the FCC might put on a broadcast just because they're good practice. Uh, mm -hmm. And because that's what our audience uh, expects, and we don't want to get in the way of our audience enjoying something. But we don't have to. Uh, that that's we, we and and not all podcasts do. Yeah, I was gonna. One, you mentioned that one of the things we try not to do on the show is curse. Even though in real life I curse like a sailor, my wife actually yells at me because I curse so much. But one of the things that we try not to do on the live broadcast is curse because we know a lot of people either a listen to live or b listen to when like they're driving and they've, maybe they've got kids in the car or whatever. Um, and so we're we we try to be cognizant of that, even though we do have a couple f bombs that swip. Uh, well, you, you wouldn't curse loudly in a restaurant either. I'm, I'm guessing, maybe. Right. Not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get a couple beers in him. Yeah. No, that's true. So one thing I was curious about there was, as as we talked about, you know, connecting with audiences. What what are some different ways that you do that? Like, you know, I, Facebook is a tool. Patreon is a tool. Um, the you know, Goodreads, things like that. Have what do you use currently, and maybe what have you learned from from that and and how to connect to readers outside of the podcast or listeners outside of the podcast. Uh, Anybody? We, Facebook's our biggest tool. Yeah, we yeah. use Facebook. For sure. Uh, Facebook and you. We like YouTube because of the um, the interaction during the live show, and it's very easy to do that interaction. For some reason, Facebook and StreamYard don't like to talk to each other very much unless they unless the user authorizes StreamYard to show their face or a name or whatever. If they're just watching on Facebook and, and chat. We don't know who it is, uh, but we use we have a Facebook group that we use a lot, um, and we have a website. Um, but uh, YouTube and Facebook are, are the biggest platforms where we interact with, like in the comments of the video after they're live and all that stuff. That's where we get our, our interaction at. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't use we don't rely on Facebook at all. We we have Facebook pages, uh, but but we actually for Sword and Laser rely almost exclusively on Goodreads. We have a Discord channel as well that gets a little bit of activity, uh, but predominantly uh, Sword and Laser's, Laser's audience is on Goodreads, and that's where we interact with them. And that makes sense because it's books. Right. Daily Tech News Show, on the other hand, we have a Twitch chat when we stream live, uh, and we have a Discord. And that, and maybe a little bit on Twitter and Patreon, is, is kind of mostly where we interact with our audience. Interesting. Uh, do you guys have any uh, specific hashtags that you use for, for any of those? You know, I I, I haven't had any hashtags uh, because I'm bad at social media, but uh, I have somebody helping me with that now, and I think she has started to use some hashtags, but I really don't know what they are. Uh, we actually, a couple of years ago, we realized that you could put hashtags in your video descriptions on YouTube. And so for like a couple of months, we were like really key in on, all right, let's get the hashtags in there. Uh, and then I just forgot. <laughs> and we had do, do they make? Do they? Do you think they really make much of a difference? I feel like they're great when they when you see them trending, but I'm not sure using them yourself really makes much of a difference. But maybe they do. I don't think it. I don't know that it does. One of the things that we have tried to do better on our videos, specifically in, in, on YouTube, is the titling and mm, how yeah. you title the episode. When we first started, it was live with this person. Um, so unless you type into YouTube that person's name, you're not going to see that that video. Uh, Lauren does this really well on the writer's journey, is specifically tagging the theme or the concept that you're talking about in that, that episode. So if they type that into either Google, because YouTube is like the second biggest uh, search engine on the internet besides just looking at Google. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can get that that title of your episode. Into, into those parameters of, of what people are looking for, that's going to help you out, I think, more than the hashtags. I yeah. so with the live show, I might have a concept of what the show is supposed to be about before we get started, but then the conversation goes somewhere else. Um, so I might have to change the title later to reflect what the show actually was and change the description to make sure it's, it's accurate. But I want to give searchers 
to help the, the ones looking for the information, to help them to find that information, to know that it's good, and then to enjoy the episode. That's my goal. So if I can do that with the title, with the description, with the tags I put in later, I'm, I'm going to think about it and I'm going to put them in. I thought I would just share a quick tip that I learned through the hard way from tagging and hashtags on uh, YouTube is I was putting location in because I thought that was critical. Like, hey, people who are local maybe will see it and things like that, especially when I was doing something on location somewhere, like a live um, sure, a broadcast sure. somewhere. Uh, but then when you put a location in, the hashtags don't populate up into the subtitle field, like up where you sometimes see them at the title. Yeah. And I learned that after like just hours and hours of mucking about. And I finally realized that. And they only take the three, uh, the first three hashtags if they're applicable. They will actually skip stuff that they think is you just trying to game the system. Mm. So actually, oh, has, I don't know how they do this, like what sort of AI they use, but they're, they can kind of pick out if you're, if you're trying, oh, this is popular. I'm just going to put James Patterson here or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. YouTube is quick. We did a we did a, an episode a couple of weeks ago where I previewed we were going to have on the, the Parapoliti brothers that wrote uh, Blood of Zeus. They're actually going to be on in a couple of weeks. Um, but the week before, I, I played the trailer of the show in the at the last part of the video, and it's like a couple minute video. And we monetize our videos even though we don't make any money off of it. But it's funny as soon as that video hit, and I had monetized it beforehand. As soon as it hit. Like five seconds later, YouTube was like, "You can't monetize this video because of copyright material." And it had the blood of Zeus thing. I was like, "How do you know already, YouTube? It's not even been out five minutes." Well, that's supposedly the next the next step, right? Is the uh, the AI transcribing the videos and then using that to create uh, key search terms and things. Right. But which and leads then me the AI into creating the videos exactly. And, yeah, that yeah, could be yeah, next. So, <laughs> and that's that's where I wanted to go with our last five minutes. Like, what do you see as? The future, what are you doing to try and future proof yourself as you know we're in this constant state of transition? Um, if anybody wants to jump into that, I, I gotta jump into this because I actually there's an AI voice of me. Uh and and in one in on the YouTube channel, there's a, a conversation I had with Joanna Penn of the Creative Pen podcast. And Joe has a an AI voice from Descript, uh it used to be Lyrebird, they're in Montreal, uh here in Canada. And I have an AI voice. So we did a conversation. We recorded it, transcribed it. Then we went back in and, and, and fed it to the AI and had the AI do the conversation. That's great. This is, and, and I know this is early phases. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's going to happen. And people are going to do that. So I want to be part of the disruption, not the disrupted. But that reminds me that the key thing that you can do in the face of AI creativity and all of those things that are coming and we can't just bury our heads in the sand and pretend they're not going to be there is doubling down on our humanity and doubling down on the authenticity that each of us has as, as human beings that people know oh you know and maybe we talked about the squeaky chair guy but maybe you know it's like if there's something that josh always does or something that lauren always says it's a token phrase that people love about them and they look forward to it with Joanna, for example, in our conversation, she has a really wonderful laugh that she, yes. that she, right? And you don't get that in the AI. It sounds like Joe, but there's no laugh. And you're like, there's something wrong. And I, I think that's going to be critical to, to, to double down on that hum, human element that we can bring. 100%. Yeah, AI's got very narrow things. It's very impressive at but it doesn't have the wide range yet. <laughs> and hopefully for not a long time uh, that that we are. I am looking forward to the AI that can take out the squeaky chair or the ums, uh, you know, and just kind of strip that out, you know, one touch. We're, we're really close to that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The AI that can actually do the show with the humanity, like you're talking about, Mark. I, I think that's quite a long way off. I think for, uh, I think for our podcast, Keystroke uh, in particular, is we're always looking at, at ways that we can bring more um, fun and uh, community uh, engagement to the show. Um, like I said, we started with one and now we do three. Um, I did a, a morning haze show for a while and that was great, but then it was eating into a lot of my writing time and I like to bring it back. Um, but uh, I think just um, looking at how you can continue to iterate yourself and not become uh, boring um, because I think, you know, some people have podcasts that are very knowledgeable podcasts, but they may not be the greatest fun to listen to. So like I want a, my podcast to be really fun and, and energetic and engaging. And that's what I try to keep in mind as we go forward and as we're doing different things. Um, as far as 
future things. I, I don't know. I, I don't know that there's any, I'm not well versed in the, what's coming up in the podcast realm of things to do. Like streaming is fun. Uh, I don't know if that would be a really fun thing to do for the show is, is doing a, uh, a stream of just like a, an hour long or a, a eight hour long stream of conversation. I don't know. That's not something I've looked into. I don't know how well uh, I, I can talk, but I don't know that I could talk for eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> So well, I, I think you nailed it when you said iterate. Uh, the mm -hmm. thing that has worked for me, and I, I've I've done three different versions of a daily show about tech news uh, over the years, and in all three of them, I constantly surveyed the audience. Well, first of all, we have ongoing integration with the chat room and emails and Discord and all of that, uh, so I pay attention to that. But once or twice a year, I will survey them and ask them uh, general questions about what they think of the show, but also specific questions that I'm wondering about, and. We, we find that you know things that used to work or used to be popular aren't popular later as things change. Platforms that that we were on in the past you know start to fall by the wayside. you know you don't you don't see us posting to Friendster anymore. <laughs> uh, so you, you've got to keep up with those as they go along and and that's that's what I try to look at when I'm looking to the future is what do people want? What kind of coverage do they want? What kinds of things do they want us to talk about for sword and laser? what kind of books are they into? Uh, how, how we choose the books that we read as part of the book club? Uh, ch has changed over the years, and we you have to just keep that ongoing conversation with your audience, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to build off of that, our audience is trying to make a career out of writing. Whether they're an illustrator or whether they're an editor or an author, they have um, bills to pay each month, and writing is what gets them through, uh, or freelancing is what gets them through. So when we think about the future and future-proofing KSM, we're not thinking necessarily about AI or VR, we're thinking about monthly bills and mm -hmm. what, what does our audience need to know in order to advance their career and how can my co-host Kayleen and I, how can we get that to them? Um, so yeah, exactly. We want to know what the audience needs, what they're interested in, uh, what they can do to get to the next step in their career and how Kayleen and I can help make that happen. And one of the great things about voice, I think, is that it does transition to different platforms. It's it's a timeless. I, I wonder about that sometimes, like how evergreen, if the content is evergreen, if people go back and I'm surprised by people that will go back and listen to a whole podcast from the beginning and then get caught up. And that's that's like finding a Netflix show that you can binge on and finding a show that has, you know, 200 episodes is like, whoo, that's that's something special. You know, I can go that watch up. our first episodes. Please don't. Go. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. But, but the whole Patrick Rothfuss is, thing came because somebody was going back and listening to our old episodes. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. But it was like, like looking at The Simpsons, right? 30 years of The Simpsons. And, and I was talking to someone yesterday about this is you look at the Tracy Ullman show and those little clips. and It's it, it's so cool to see that progression and go wow oh you know uh josh just got a new mic right like he started off with the little crappy headset thing and now yeah. he's, he's upgraded so I, I think that's really awesome to see especially in this binge world that we live in yeah so as a as our last question can we why don't we share something that um where a guest surprised you or uh kind of gave you something that you didn't expect from, you know, through your podcast, that way that it's maybe changed you or something you've learned? Well, the thing that always uh, comes to my mind, I don't think it changed me or anything, uh, but we, we were really excited to get George R. R. Martin on Sword and Laser about five years ago or so, uh, right, right in the middle of the, the run of Game of Thrones on HBO, uh, maybe six years ago now, I guess, but we were talking with him and it was going the way you would expect. He was answering our questions. We were at, we were, you know, having a good interview. And then, uh, Veronica, my co-host asked him about the Avengers, uh, and what he thought of it. And you could just see him light up. Uh, and he's like, yeah, it was great. I enjoyed it, but where was Ant-Man? I want Ant-Man. And this is before <laughs> the Ant-Man movies had even been mm -hmm. announced. And, and uh, the thing I realized was like, Everyone you interview, no matter how famous or, or not they are, has something that gets them animated and gets them excited. And, and the trick in an interview is to, to try to find that thing, try to find that thing that gets them excited and, and brings them out because it loosens you up. It loosens them up. It's fun for the listeners. And, and all of our conversation after that was better because, because of that. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, uh, well, two things that I've, I've learned um, is... I, I love having 
authors on and like we've had david weber we've had michael j sullivan uh lauren just had ra salvatore on um whenever we end a show and they tell me this was the funnest show that they've ever been on or the funnest podcast and they come back anytime that just makes my day like that really just makes my day um but one of the things that um i guess nick sansbury smith came on the show and one of the things that he told us and this was the first time he came on back in season two uh, one of the things that affected how I go through the show uh, is like all of us every week or, or in Tom's case, every day they get on and they talk to the, the mic, the mic and the, and the camera and we get very comfortable on it and we can just hop on and just start talking and it, it, like it's nobody's business. Um, but some of the guests that we have on don't. And so when they get on, they're very nervous. Um, and sometimes they, um, uh, they don't know how to respond or they don't know like what you expect from them. And so a lot of times I'll have guests on early and just have a conversation with them before we go live and, and just say, look, the conversation we're having right now before we go live is exactly how we're going to talk on the show. There's no difference. Like you're, we're not going to be on stage in front of millions of people. At least there's going to be people watching, um, but to try to get them into a, a very relaxed um, mode and so they they don't get to 45 minutes in and we have an hour show 45 minutes in now they're comfortable and now they're talking but in 15 minutes i know i'm gonna have to kill the show because uh unless they have david weber on we've had like a three hour long david weber show because he's just very talkative but that's one of the things that i've i, I learned starting off is is to get people relaxed uh and try to get people to relax and that'll help your show out a lot mm -hmm. i looked up to podcasters so much I had a list of podcasts I watched and I, I listened to them religiously you know, every week for, for years before Josh finally dragged me into doing it. <laughs> and I put them on a pedestal in my mind. And when I started podcasting, I was thinking, okay, this is what I have to do. But in the course of bringing people on the sh to the show and talking to them, I found out they're just people. We're all just people. We're... <laughs> We're not a different species. We're not, you know, up there. We're regular folks with regular feelings. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Um, and then these conversations we're having, we're becoming friends right in front of the audience. Uh, it's exciting, it's humbling. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of pressure off when you realize that you know, Christopher Berlin, George R. R. Martin, just another dude, just like I'm just another gal and we can have this conversation, we can share what we learn, we can move forward. Listeners, they can gain something or they can go, no, I don't necessarily agree with that or it's not gonna fit in my writing process and, and that's totally fine. Um, but we're just having a conversation together, the audience is a part of it and um, I'm just another person like the audience is too. And that, and that kind of reminds me of, of, of I, I, the honor that you get to have a big name and they're willing to come on your show and they said yes and you're thrilled. But I've also, I, and I go back to Michael Connolly's Harry Bosch where he says everybody matters or nobody matters. And and when I bring some a guest onto my show, it doesn't matter if they are a New York Times bestselling author or they've been in the industry for decades and know all kinds of great things. They could have not even written their first book yet. They're a beginning writer and I have just as much to learn from them. And yeah. that's the thing that continually surprises me. And then try to bring on different guests because I know if I open up my mind, I can learn so much about the world because as Lauren said, everyone's just that person who's probably, you know, passionate like you know, about the Avengers or or whatever, right? They're all they're all there and we're all learning from each other. And that to me is the greatest learning experience of of being a podcaster. Mm -hmm. Things change so fast now that you never know who you'll learn something from potentially. Someone could bring something from another industry, another perspective. Um, and we have the opportunity to speak to so many people out there. We we just got a comment uh, from Edwin saying, I'm humbled by the number of podcast hosts who've responded to a comment I left on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we have these opportunities to speak and have a conversation with people that we, you know, back when I first started volunteering in radio, you were just talking to a mic going into the, uh, the ether and had no idea where it was going. Um, and it's, it's very different now, which is exciting. Um, so I recognize Edwin actually, he commented oh, yeah. last week 
<laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Mark brought him over. Okay, well, I think we're we are out of time. I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this and uh, being part of the inaugural F- SFF Con uh, convention as we get these uh, get all this squared away. It's been fun, and if anything good has come out of COVID, it's maybe um, new opportunities like this, you know, virtual conventions and things. So I appreciate everyone taking the time to do it. Um, if anyone listening has questions, we'll have the Discord set up, which you can find through the SFFCon website, and we'll check, on, check in on those and do our best to, uh, to answer following up. So did anybody have anything else they wanted to end with, like a last message or, or uh, anything to get out there? Thanks for listening. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Thanks for listening. Go, go start a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.